All right. We have Zyro versus Renner in a, a different form of video here. Again, we had a new player tournament. We had a crazy amount of signups. I believe it was 26. So there are too many replays for me to get through in the live stream. I'm going to try and get some of them in this post thing. So this video is going to be, uh, I believe, three games from the new player tournament that I sifted through and I thought they were interesting enough to cast. So here we have Zyro versus Renner. Beastman versus Vampire Coast. Vampire Coast brought a front line of pole arms, a one pistol mob, triple depth guard with pole arms, all triple gold chevrons, Count Noctilus on foot, then animated hulks, Morngulls, and a carronade. And if triple gold chevron, depth guard with halberds is not enough to pique your interest, then I don't know what is, and I guess you should just stop watching Total War. I mean, come on, man. This is the fun that our new player tournaments get. You get some wacky ass builds, not always meta stuff. The other side for the Beastmen, we have Ungor, Spearman, Herds, four Archers, three Minotaurs, all of them with shields, including the Butcher's Skeleton Guard, Torx of Brass Bull, a Deathcaster, Spirit Leech, and Fate of Buna, and then some Centigors. Regular. I will say that Renner's build is much more meta, and honestly, I mean, if we're, if we're memes aside and just saying, like, which is a better build, I do think that this Beastman build is well put together and very competitive and strong. Pistol Mob firing back, but against four archers, they stood no chance and are going to die swiftly. But the Depth Guard with Pole Arms and Morngold Haunters are now starting to get involved. Centaur is going to run for their lives from those spooky, spooky, crawly ghost zombie things. And Count Noctilus actually gets put out to pasture a little bit, as all the cows. Haha! See what I did there? Ah, I'm smart and funny. People love me. Count Noctilus is fighting against Torox and all of these Minos. He's not having a good time. Those Depth Guard Polearm teams are coming to save him. And a Centigore did sneak around and get onto the Carinade while I wasn't looking. And apparently while the Coast wasn't looking either, the animated Hulks are quick to peel them out of a bad situation. Depth Guard Polearms fighting against all these Minotaurs and Torox. They are loving that. It's a big, good, fancy time for them. They're loving it so much. And that Count Noctilus is going to get away for now, but he gets Spirit Leech. And I don't see any healing for him just yet. He has not thrown out an Invocation of a Heck onto himself. Chucks out a zombie deckhand mob instead. If that was not... If that was the moon dial, fine. But if that was a natural zombie summon, he really should use that Winds of Magic to heal himself, considering how badly he's doing. Carinade, for the first time in its life, is doing well, as it's just... Oh, it's murdering this Bray Shaven of Death! What the hell? It's not Chevron or anything. It's just... It's just not missing, and it kills him. Okay. Okay, that's the first time I've seen a Carinade not miss several times in a row, but if it hits, it apparently just massacres that Chariot Caster, who is shattered. That's honestly just unlucky from the Beastman. I have never seen a Carinade do that much damage. So now the Carinade is fighting Torox and still getting massive value. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and the Archers are doing well shooting at all these halberds, even the armored halberds, because uh, they're unshielded. Though I will say, they might want to find a way to navigate around and shut down this carronade, because it is doing so much damage. But Torox is after Noctilus, who does use an indication to on himself, but he's on fire, which reduces the amount of healing he can receive, and Torox just don't miss as he puts the Count Noctilus in the ground. The captain is dead. There's no caster, there's no leadership for the Vampire Coast, as already a bunch of their zombies are crumbling away, and some of these zombies are summons, so when they fade, it'll be even worse. For the Beastmen, they're down on the balance of power. Torox is still getting poked by that cannon that must have insane value right now. Yeah, 2,000 value on a cannon. Oof. I wish my cannons did that much. Do you know how many times I've tried to use the Vampire Coast cannons and they did nothing? So many times. So many times. <laughs> Alright, we still have some healthy Depth Guard. Three of them. One is at half HP, the other two are much healthier than that. We do have one full health Morngull, full health animated Hulk, and that is about it. Carinade attempt to the Centaurs this time managed to take out that Carinade and then run off to safety. And the Ungor Raiders are going to try and kite out these Death Guard with Pole Arms, get away from them for a little bit and get some damage out. Though the Morngulls are making that rather difficult, disrupting these guys and doing damage. While Torox tries to peel, Depth Guard are trying to catch up to him. But without the cannon, now Torox isn't on a ticking time bomb for when he's just definitely going to die as the cannon shoots at him from across the distance. He can run away and stay alive perpetually. Butcher's Calvin Guard regenerating off on the sides. We'll see if they can get a charge soon. And Torox is getting eaten alive by the Death Guard Pole Arms. He starts to path out. And with his superior speed, he should be able to get some distance from these guys and just get to safety for a little bit. 
archers have to be the heroes of the day for the vampire coast. Not that. The exact opposite of that. The beastmen. <laughs> Ungar Raiders are going to have to carry this game. It looks like for now they're shooting at the animated hulks, trying to take out some of that extra speed. Though Depth Guard are vampiric units, they're not zombies, so they do have an impressive 36 speed of their own. It's not like they're really going to fall that far behind. Ungar Raiders firing away at whatever they can. Morngol's going to route some more of the people. Bounce power is coming a little bit back towards the middle. Torox and the lads continue on. But man, imagine if that Fate of Unicaster hadn't get one, got one shot by the cannon. <laughs> Two or three Fate of Bunas in the late game? Oh. Oh. Coast would be toast. Butch's Calvin Guard and Torox do take a fight with these Depth Guard. I don't believe they were braced at the time because they were moving, but still, they're super elite halberds. And Torox won't want to be in this fight for too long. Archers have taken the day off of the Morngulls. They used to be full health. Now they're less than half and falling. Animated Hulk's crumbling away. They do straight up disintegrate. And the Butchers taking massive damage from the Death Guard. They have to back off now. Their charge bonus is worn off. And yeah, they just fall apart in front of our eyes. Oh, they're toast. They are toast. They shatter. The other Minotaurs and Torox charge back in. Do a little bit of damage here and there. Morgul's going to chase off more archers. These Depth Guard continue to heal up from their hunger. I'm going to kill off the last archer that is here and firing for now. One Depth Guard does begin to crumble just a little bit under the threat of all these Centigors and Torox. And meanwhile, the zombies walking forward also still crumbling slowly but surely. Archers rallying in the distance, firing around, but it's really these Morgul's that are a huge problem. They just keep running, running these archers down, cycle routing them. Centaur's going to try and charge the Depth Guard. Now, there is only one healthy Depth Guard left. The other ones are crumbling, plus almost crumbling. Ungor Spirit Herd's trying to rejoin the fight. It looks like they're shattering after just too many, too many trips to Route Town. A good old drive down Route 67. Morgul's taking a little bit of poke, but the archers can't kill them in time. They'll need Torox and the Centigors or someone to peel for them, but the Torox, Torox and the Centigors are busy doing other things. And I swear that Centigor was healthy just a second ago, but the Halberds still tear it apart. And things are starting to shatter. Army losses is coming in. And that'll be it for the Beastmen. As the Triple Gold Chevron Depth Guard, we're way too much for our cow friends. 2,200 value, uh, 1,900, 1,400 for them. Morgul's... Neither of them came close to paying for themselves, but they were very important chasing down those archers. The cannon did fantastically, and I'm still shocked. You might be like, stop mentioning the cannon. I won't, because I, in Warhammer 3, I have never seen a Vampire Coast cannon do anything close to that useful. And this one just, just deleted some pools. For Renner, Torox did amazing. Um, Minos really struggled, unfortunately. Deathcaster also struggled, because he just didn't get to get a lot of casts off. Santagors and Archers did fine. Um, I do think this build could work. I really wouldn't change it for Renner. I think he got both unlucky. That is Caster died. Because if he had one or two Fate of Bunas throughout that game, I think he would have won for sure. Um, so that's just unfortunate. And sure, there were some minor misplays. But like, I do think the large, large part of it is just, oh, wow, Vampire Coast Cannon deleted my caster. Well, rip. You know. So I, like, I liked his build, I think. Just... Should happen sometimes. Another Beastman replay here, this time from Niklaus on the Tomb Kings and Pavilion on the Beastmen. Now Zyro and Pavilion had another replay that was also pretty good, and I thought about casting it, but uh, I don't know. I didn't feel like casting two, well, three, I guess, Beastmen replays in a row, and two of them from Pavilion versus the Tomb Kings because the other game was also Tomb Kings vs. Beastmen. I was like, eh, I'll just cast one of these, and Zyro got on with that uh, Vampire Coast build, so we'll just call it. Beastmen vs. Tomb Kings. For the Beastmen, we have Centigors, Harpies, Razorgore Herds, Ungor Raiders, a front line of Ungor Spearing Herds with one regular Ungor Herd, two Centigors Throwing Axes, three Minotaurs, one is regular. Actually, not even regular. I suppose you would call this regular, but I, I typically think of the Shields as being regular. This is the specifically anti-infantry version. And then a Great Bracium and a Wild of Traitorkin. On the other side, for the Tomb Kings, we have one Scream Skull Catapult, the Eyes of the Desert Support Stalker, Tomb Guard with Halberds, Skeleton Spears, and Skeleton Warrior Frontline, the Sphinx of Us Usek, a Necrotech to heal it up, and then Ark in the Black with Fabian and Spear Leech. And during this specific new player tournament, 
This happens all the time, and I don't know why, but new player tournaments get a flavor. They get a flavor that every new player in the tournament decides, yeah, we're gonna take this unit. We're just gonna do that. A couple tournaments, it was the Black Guard of Nagaron, and in this tournament, it was this Sphinx. The ROR Sphinx showed up in so many games, and it wasn't all one person. It's not like Nick Klaus. Every game he played, he brought the Sphinx. He was like, I, I think... Honestly, I think Zyra brought it. I think somebody else brought it too versus uh, Electric Spinach. It was just, this thing was all over the stream, and I haven't seen it in forever, but whatever. Anyway, Harpies dive in, kill off the Screaming Skull Catapult, and then get routed. That's actually a pretty good trade for the Beastmen. They'll come back at half HP apiece, but they killed an entire Screaming Skull Catapult for that. effort. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Good job, Harpies. Ungo Raiders getting into range, firing all into the Skeleton Spearman front line to help the Beastmen get through it faster and start pressuring that back line. Though honestly, most of this Tomb King's build is a is, uh, front line. The only range left to even disrupt is the Eyes of the Desert. Everything else is just going to have to be in the melee, which the Beastmen are plenty capable of doing, because the archers are taking their day out on the Spearmen. I don't really like separating out your archers like this. I know it's tempting, because they have stock and vanguard, and you can do cool stuff, but then things like this happen, where any unit that's faster can just run at them, and now there's nothing here to protect them. There's no Minotaurs to punish this. There's no Centigors that can even run around and do things. It's just like, oh, I'm going to lose my archers. So I do think that's a bit of a mistake. I understand what he was going for, and it's it's a bit cheeky. But versus, like, players instead of AI, the players will just come out and beat up your archers. In the background, we have a Fate of Buna going on, but who? A Fate of Buna, the Razor Gore Herds. All right. Really did not like those 600 gold pigs. I don't know if that's a worthwhile cast. Uh, you could fade a bit of these centaurs with throwing axes. That would be much more with your time. Or even, honestly, the Minotaurs could be pretty good. But it's not a terrible cast. It's not like fade a buning a single entity, which is just flat out a mistake. I just think it's less optimal to fade a bit a 600 gold pig. Sporkle Stalker's trying to catch up to those archers, but they get disrupted by harpies. The Sphinx of Usef and Necrotech realize they have better things to do than chase around archers, so they do go back to the main fight, which is fine. And these Ungar Raiders are now under duress once again. Centaurs and Throwing Axes get caught up in a Spearman. Ooh, that is a really bad time for them. They want to get out of there as fast as possible. It looks like they're caught up with some Razor Core Herds, too. Great Bright Shaman Wild already terror routing away from the Sphinx, but he does stop routing. And I think the player might... The player might be hoping that he uh, kept routing, because that would have been nice and easier on him, rather than stopping to fight the Sphinx. As he gets Spirit Leeched and hit by the Sphinx, he might get knocked out here. That Sphinx is a terrifying duelist. He's very weak in other areas and quite expensive, which is why we don't see him a lot. But he is really good at fighting a giant monster if he gets the chance. And I guess a chariot isn't a giant monster, but it's large. You get the point. Backline for the Beastmen has fallen apart as the Tomb Kings just push him away with halberds. And throwing axes. Throwing away. Trying to get rid of some spearmen. A couple of their models are still caught. How's the Minotaur count? Very healthy. Very healthy and very healthy. Okay, all three Minos are still chilling. So if this Bray Shaman of Wilds can come back, eh, he's just not going to. The Tomb Kings are right here. Ark can get one more Spirit Leech, and then that guy's either dead or so low that he's a Beastman caster. He's just going to go off the battlefield. So Beastman about to lose their leadership and their magic, which could be a disaster in this game. We'll have to see. What's going well for the Beastman is they are killing the front line. The Tomb Kings are starting to run out of random troops. They're getting down to just Halberds, which Throwing Axes and Archers can tax them for quite a while. The Sporkle Stalkers also seem to have been forgotten in the in the wilderness for a bit. Now they're taking free poke from Archers as they try to run away from these Spearmen. But the Tomb Kings' main single entity squad, as I accidentally go inside of a rock here, their main single entity squad is chilling. That's most of what they need. Trader King Caster is back. He gets rear charged by Arkin, and that'll route him again. Right next to the edge of the map, he might also take his Centigors with him. So that's a big win for is it two games? Summon is holding back a bunch of Minos. Ooh, and Centaurs are throwing ammunition at a summon, which is not worth their time. They really need to be spending their ammunition back here on the Halberds. More expensive, more elite units that actually matter. And these Minotaurs need to be cycle charging more. They can't just stand and fight in all these spears and halberds. It's not worth their time, unfortunately. Ushapti Summon is out from the Tomb Kings, artificially inflating their balance of power, so we'll see how that goes. And the Minos, this is a decent fight for them. They want to fight the Sphinx, the Necrotect, and Arkin off on their own with no support. That'll be fine. Yeah. As they try and herd them in. That's a, that's a good play. Back here, they probably just need to let these Minotaurs abandon the fight, which now they're routing, so they'll do it anyway. But uh, Archers should be firing in on these Halberds consistently and just getting that free damage while the Ungar Spearman here is hold for a little bit. Here comes the big fight, Sphinx of Usef and 
the Necro attacks, getting some support from Arkin as all of these Minotaurs just crush through them and then throwing extra gun support too. This is a really good catch by the Beastman. I don't know if it'll work out because the Sphinx is such a terrifying combatant who's also receiving a restore right now. And the Beastman lost their Lord, so the Minotaurs might route faster than you'd expect. But this is like the best case scenario and what you can hope to do here. Though the Necrotech brought like that really good item. Yeah, he did. He brought the Vambraces of the Sun. All that's brutal. It applies blinded on melee contact without a cooldown. So these guys are pretty pretty much getting a constant minus 24-24 for their melee stats, which is really brutal. Not that, I, again, I still think that the Minos had to take this fight and try and turn things around, but it's just, ugh. That Tomb King's Necrotech is really supporting this fight. But if you had a Traitor King caster right now, imagine like an overcast Traitor King right now. Necrotech would die, Arkin would get so low that the Minos could probably finish him off, and then you could turn this game around, but the caster getting sniped earlier is just putting is just putting the death nail and all that. Necrotech is starting to crumble, and he will get charged by these Minos who are returning to the fight soon. Arkin also took a good amount of damage, but a skeleton summon will save him at the last moment. And now, without the Necrotech in the fight, these guys have been freed up from that constant uh, burning Vambrace debuff. So they're chilling for a bit. Sparkle's Doctor's still managing to hang on, though, and Archer's not really getting to shoot. Still a lot of Halberds, and these Minotaurs are once again fighting the Halberds all alone. I think the Beastmen had the tools to win this, and I think they had some good engagements, but I think they just unfortunately took too many bad engagements, and that did end up costing them the game. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's not like their build was inherently bad and couldn't win. It wasn't like they played terribly. It was just a couple things didn't go their way and it kind of snowballed out of control. Nice GG. Good game there from Nick Klaus and Pablon. <clears throat> Sphinx and Arkin did fine. Sparkle Stalkers honestly didn't do much. That's one thing for the Tomb Kings I could say that they could do better is their... Sporkle Stalkers need to be shooting at Minos or committing to chase down the archers, and they just kind of didn't do either. They frequently got caught out and did nothing. Aside from that, the Tomb Kings played pretty darn well. That was really the only point of mistake I saw. Favelon, Minos did okay, especially one of them did amazing, but... Razorgore Herds did not very much, unfortunately, here. Harpies actually did pretty well for what they needed to do. The catapult didn't get stand a chance, and after that, they were just annoying and saved the archers a couple times. So, GG overall. And we'll end it out with a bit of a silly one. Buttonized Mark versus Kytus. Dark Elves versus Skaven. This matchup is actually okay for the Skaven. It's not good. I'd still say it's Dark Elf favored, but it's not unwinnable. It is one of my least favorite matchups because I just, personally, I hate fighting Dark Elf as any faction. And then as Skaven, it feels like too much guesswork where I really just don't want to deal with it. But it's not unwinnable, for sure. On the side of the Skaven and Kytus, we have two Warplock Gisele teams, some Storm Vermin with Halberds, Night Runners with Slings, Death Runners, Clan Rat Spears, more Death Runners, Clan Rat Frontline 2. We have Gorich with Warp Frenzy as his only ability, Queek Head Taker with Trophy Heads, and then his Warp Stone, Warp Shard Armor. Warlock Engineer with Flensing Ruin, Howling Warp Gale, and uh, Warp Lightning, plus his Mortis Engine. And that is it. On the other side, for the Dark Elves, we have Malice Dark Blade, already at half HP from two Giselles shooting him in the face. Two Feral Manticores, the Crows of Cain, some Cold One Knights, and the Bleak Swords, Witch Elves, Black Arc Corsairs, and a Deathcaster with Fate of Buma and Spirit Leech. Manticores dive straight in onto the Warplock Giselles, trying to disrupt them and stop them from shooting for a little bit. They do get decent damage out as well, as Gorich and Queek need orders onto the Feral Manticores soon, so they can go beat it up. They are close, but they don't have orders onto it, so they're not actually going to attack just yet. Skaven Slave Slingers get attacked by the Crows of Cain, get pushed away. Clan Rats roll out to go fight Witch Elves and stuff, keep them away from the back line, which is fine. Death Runners are going to go try and fight... Uh, Coldwell Knights. Paired up with Clan Rat Spears, this could actually be okay, because the Death Runners do shred 50% of your armor with the Reaping Blades, and that'll make the Clan Rat Spears actually have a better time versus the Coldwell Knights, so I like that. I like that a lot. Meanwhile, a Fate of Buna onto Ixus Triads, which I didn't even notice Ixus Triads were here, but they're dead now, so I guess it doesn't really matter. More Death Runners running down Dread Spears in the distance, and Giselle's trying to get some distance as Queek and Gorge still attempt to really find a fight. And Storm Vermin with Halberds get uh, Manticore to Rampage into them, so they'll take that out rather quickly, but say goodbye to that other Zale team. 
Clan rats and death runners fighting back against these bleak swords. Dread spears all moving in and such. But the hero hammer for the Skaven have really not been able to find a fight. They don't have a ton of value. Gorge looks like he fought a Manticore off screen for just a little bit, but. Skaven losing their weapons teams is brutal. Now, this is a very melee focused Skaven build, so I guess their weapons team isn't everything, but it is still bad to lose those Giselles. They're about a thousand gold apiece. So that's 2,000 gold off the battlefield if those Crows of Cain finish chasing off the Warplucked Giselles, which it looks like they will. Death Run is trying to fight back. Clan Rats holding down Cold Knights. Cold Knights, like green skinned Boar Boys, just have an awful time fighting infantry. So. This is not a worthwhile trade for them, and they want to get out of here. Gorge is chasing down the Deathcaster, and he should pummel her. Whenever he doesn't knock her over, he has an impressive bonus versus infantry of 30, so he has 100 melee attack right now. There we go. See, he just crunches through her HP bar. Getting rid of a Deathcaster is pretty huge for this Gaven. Ixus Triads still fighting alongside Queek, and the Warlock Engineer is currently draining down two different guys while he's also going to get off a of Warp Lightning. Gorge terror routes off the Sorcerers of Death. And Skaven are clearing through a lot of stuff. We'll see how Queek can do versus Malice. That's going to be a big problem. As Malice pops in, all of his buffs, all of his debuffs, everything onto Queek. Queek, can he fight back? No trophy heads cast just yet. I wonder if it's still on cooldown. Oh, he's rampaging. Okay, well, he can't. He can't cast it then. Gorch gets surrounded by Cold Knights in the distance, and the Deathcaster does return. Meanwhile, a Manticore helps those other Cold Knights get rid of the Clan Rats, and Deathrunners are still fighting for their lives. Queek routes away from Malice, which is going to be a huge problem. But elsewhere, the Dark Elves are running out of momentum a little bit as this Warlock Engineer continues to just drain these fools down. Bounce power turns against Skaven. I definitely agree. Gorch is back. This could honestly come down to just a Lord Snipe. If Malice either doesn't turn to Zarkan, just forgets and terror routes because he does not have ITP from Gorge. So if he terror routes from Gorge, the Skaven could still win. Or if he transforms into Zarkan and Gorge still kicks his ass, which is unlikely but possible, you know, the Skaven could win this. But oof, Cold Knights are going to make sure Queek doesn't come back, which is pretty brutal. Gorge is rampaging. Thankfully, he still chooses the right target in Malice. He is going to get one more hit off. That would rout Malice, but he misses. And then Zarkan's going to come out, and that's probably going to be GG, as he's going to cast all of his abilities as soon as he transforms like he usually does. And that'll drain Gorich low enough, that'll drain all of his support low enough, this escape will just army loss and lose. Hey, exactly what I said happened, that's crazy. GG. It was fun to see Queek and Gorich. As for army feedbacks, uh, Button Eyes Mark did fine. I generally don't take Cold Knights here at all. I like the rest of the build, but I skip Cold Knights and just get Dark Riders. Because Skaven, their large targets don't have armor anyway, so the armor piercing is kind of wasted. And their small targets that are armored, Cold Knights just suck at dealing with them. So just get Dark Riders, save yourself a bit of money there. Um, what you could get with the extra money is get a shade. Like just one shade could be really nice if the enemy goes with a Gray Seer. You have a stocked AP Archer that you bring in in the late game. Because that's the thing, is you bring it in the late game. You don't put it up front where it gets spotted right away, and then Avalanche Mortars or Gisales or something just kill it immediately. But uh, pull the shade up behind your army, but then it's stalked so the Skaven can't shoot at it. And once the enemy range is shut down, then the shades just pump the Grace here full of damage. Um, I think that would be fine. I don't think Cold One Knights are particularly useful here. That'd be my only thing. And then play-wise, you played fine. I didn't really see too many issues. Malice took too much damage at the start from Gisales by just sitting around, but that shit happens. It's Malice. He'll be fine. For Kytus, uh, the build was fun. The build could use some work. Stormbreaker and Halberds did strangely well, which they usually don't. So, I guess I would say still cut them because I still think they think they suck. But, you know, if they did well here, then I guess you can take them if you really want to. Gisales are okay. I still think you need Globes. You need Poison Globes to kill off Dark Riders or enemy clumps. Clan Rats are fine over Skaven Slaves. Skaven Slaves just route immediately. I'd cut the Night Runner Slings too. Skaven Slave Slings generally just do as well. And again, this is going to be a weird example because the Night Runner Slings did fine and so did the Slaves, but whatever. Ixus Triad is okay. Warlock Engine is okay if you have a different Lord. I think Queek just sucks. You forgot to give orders to him for a bit, but Queek does just suck. He doesn't even win. He's a Lord Duelist that doesn't even win Lord Duels. So, I don't know. He's just bad. Gorge is honestly fine here. Gorge is fine. I have him in some of my builds. I stopped taking him during the Malekith meta because Soul Sealer is so brutal for Gorge and Malekith can just fly away. Plus shades and dark shards can poke him down and stuff, but like I don't know, you need something to do with Malice, you need something to do with Manticores, So Gorch is honestly fine. Death Runners, I don't know. I'd cut him for Plague Monks. Plague Monks do the same thing, but uh, 
against low armored targets, which the, the Dark Elves don't really have armor, so the Death Runners are a little bit wasted. So just get Plague Monks. It's 200 gold cheaper, and the same thing, but just versus low armor, which they, these guys are. GG. Rawr. Subscribe, yes, yes.